I'm going to bring to life the words of Andrew Baxter, a retired police lieutenant. He previously released a video of 10 things to think about when trying to understand the deep workings of a public safety telecommunicator. We're going to talk about 911 operators and emergency dispatchers. You won't want to miss the last one, but I think some of the thoughts in between will be shocking enough. This is uh, geared towards the civilians of the world, the regular citizens who may not know what goes on behind the scenes. It's geared towards the cops that use the dispatchers, and it's geared towards the administrators of these large departments, or even small departments. These are just 10 things that I want you to think about. I started my career as a dispatcher for two and a half years. That's what I did. I worked 911, I worked the radio, I kind of did it all. A few decades later, as a lieutenant, I came back to run the exact same comm center that I had previously worked in. And there's one thing that I noticed that hadn't changed, and that's trauma. Here are some things that I would like for you to think about for the mental health and well-being of your dispatchers. Number 10, you know, it's kind of a myth to think that hearing trauma is not worse than experiencing it. Now, I'm not talking about the danger involved, the cops or the firefighter. Paramedics understand the danger involved of being at a scene where something traumatic is going on. Listening to the same thing and being there are two different things. So danger aside, the trauma is the exact same. It's the screams, it's the horrific sound that the dispatchers can't control and they're listening to. And the fact that it's raw, it's happening as it's happening. Generally, when emergency personnel arrive, it's a few minutes later. Things have calmed down a little bit, even though it may be still chaotic. It's not that way for the emergency communicators. They are constantly trying to keep them calm and trying to get the information needed to help save lives. So it's essentially live terror. These are noises that they can't control. There are screams in the background. There are gunshots, sometimes in the background, or pleas for help. And these are the things that really work on the dispatcher and on their psyche. You can't change those things. You can't fix them, and you certainly can't teleport yourself there to help. There's no ability to process that scene. By the way, when the emergency responder shows up and sees, you know, maybe the gruesomeness of the whole thing, at least they can develop a sense of what happened and move on with the trauma. The dispatcher, on the other hand, is left to fill in a bunch of blanks because they never saw what happened. All they have is what's in their mind, in what they imagine. So with that, number nine, there's a high turnover rate in the emergency communications field. They're understaffed, there's a high level of absenteeism, and there's a reason for all of that. There's an accumulation of trauma that's unprecedented. It just keeps building and building and building. And when you think about it, as an emergency worker, say, police officer, fire paramedic, you may go through an entire shift. You might go an entire week without seeing a traumatic incident or hearing anything traumatic. An emergency communications dispatcher has a 100% chance on their shift, a 100% chance. Where I worked, all of the phone calls for the entire county came into one place and they were routed to where they needed to go. So if it was a medical emergency, the cops never even heard about it. It was routed over to the county fire or the paramedics. But you see, the dispatchers still have to deal with the raw emotion of that emergency during it over and over and over again. It'll make you sick. The brain is processing stuff and it's probably not meant to process. And the dispatchers and emergency communicators that I know work with are amazing at compartmentalizing and putting on a good show, so to speak. But it is taking its toll on them little by little. There's probably very little sick time in the bank of a typical emergency communications dispatcher because some days, understandably, they just don't have it. And that creates a problem because they're already short-staffed because people quit people can't handle the trauma and whether they like that as the reason or not or whether they know that's the reason that they leave. So there's a high level of absenteeism, there's understaffing issues and sometimes there is forced overtime. So whether you want to work overtime or not, you're going to work overtime because they're too short. You see, on the street, if an officer doesn't show up for work, you probably have two or three other officers that can help cover that zone. It, it doesn't work that way in 911, it doesn't work that way on the radio. You need a person in each seat to man that position or else the system's going to break. If there's nobody there to answer the radio or, or there's nobody there to answer the phone, how are you going to know where to go?
Number eight, there's nowhere to go after a call when things are really bad, like there's a baby drowning or a mother calls and there's an overdose or God forbid, they deal with a suicide, which we'll get into in a minute. There's really nowhere to go once they're off the phone with that person. They have four walls that they deal with and that's it. They have four walls and each other. Certainly they can get up and take a break or walk around and some places have had the foresight to give them a quiet space or give them dogs or something just to break the chain a little bit. But generally, there's no closure to what they just endured over the phone. And you know, what happens within the next two or three minutes of them sitting there. Another phone call comes in and they're responsible for answering it and they're responsible for being put together enough to answer the questions to get the information to save lives. Number seven, I don't know if it's like this in the fire and paramedic world, but sometimes in police agencies, the administration tends to pile on responsibilities on the communication center simply because they're there 24 seven. So just because somebody is there 24 seven does not mean they have the proper manning and the proper attention span to be able to handle the tasks adequately. Every new app that comes out or every new warning system or alarm system that comes out generally gets dumped on the communication center. Just give it to them. They're going to be there 24 seven. Have them monitor it. They're there 24 seven. But there's only so many people and those people are already doing something. So you're stretching them even thinner by giving them different tasks and new tasks to learn let alone being stretched so thin and having to hear new alarms and new bells and all of the noise and the chaos that goes on in a 911 center and a communication center. Do you realize that when there's an accident on a major interstate, people don't stop calling 911 until they see red and blue lights or until they see a fire truck there so they can handle 30 or 4911 calls for the exact same car accident, but there's only two or three people handling it. They're stretched very thin. And when you start piling on more new gadgets and apps, they're not apt to say no, they're not in a position to say no because they're in the civilian side. Which brings me to my next point. Number six, they're often lumped in as clerical staff. So let's think about this for a second. You have the cops or you have the firefighter paramedics and then you have the dispatchers slash civilians of the agency. So the executive assistant of the chief of police or Marsha, the payroll clerk, or Julie down in HR, Steve at the radio shop, they're all lumped in the exact same category as these emergency communications dispatchers. Given what they're listening to, doing, and the lives that they affect. Do you think that that's fair? Emphasize, it's not. And they're treated as such. There is a caste system that seems, and though everybody gets along, there's a pecking order and it's a law enforcement agency. Uh, law enforcers are who they focus on and these dispatchers are exposed to equal amounts of trauma as some of the officers are. Number five. If you go into a room of seasoned dispatchers and there are say 10 of them in there and you ask them, would you please raise your hand if you've been on the phone when somebody has committed suicide? I'll guarantee you will see nine hands go up, if not 10, this happens so frequently and nobody ever talks about it. People call in and give their last will and testament to the 911 operators all the time. People call in to try to reason themselves out of suicide, but they end up committing suicide on the phone with the dispatcher. There are extreme examples where violent domestics are occurring and say the husband is breaking the door down and the wife's on the phone saying if he makes it in here, he's going to kill me. And sure enough, the next thing the dispatcher hears is a bunch of gunshots, a scream and the guy yelling. So essentially the emergency call taker just listened to a murder. It is a tough job. It's not clerical by any stretch of the imagination. Make sure you stick around for these last few because they are important. Number four, the death of a co-worker is devastating. Now think about this. It's bad enough that you have to deal with the chaos on the phone. Think about the people that you're charged with protecting on the radio. There was a great example with that incident in Chicago when the dispatcher took complete control of the airwaves. When Officer Ella French was murdered and he did his damnedest to get the person caught and to get those officers to the safety and medical attention that they need. 
Unfortunately, Officer Ella French was beyond help at that point in time. And you could hear in his voice the urgency. And you could also hear his voice, the compassion. When he found out what happened to these people, the dispatchers feel that they're responsible for your life. They are your lifeline. And whether it's a tragic traffic accident or a shooting after a shooting, well, sometimes they're the last voice that the officer heard. They take safety very seriously. Number three, something we do constantly, and it's unfair. It is so easy for us on the street to be able to command from our vehicles, hey, call this person and tell them this is not what comes to you. However, somebody has to talk to that person on the phone and reason with the person called either 911 or the non-emergency line for service. And they're not getting the service and you're asking the dispatcher to come back for whatever reason and tell them, we're not going to provide you that service. Now, this is a give and take. I understand there are times when making the call for service should not have made it into the system and that's too bad. There are other times when we just unfairly say, no, this isn't a legal matter. It's a civil matter, just deal with it. Call him and tell him we're not coming without much explanation. These people don't have law degrees, they don't know. So they're having a call back in 87 year old lady and explain to her why we're not coming out because the guy from India called and tried to get her Windows password. It's not easy, it's not as easy as you think. Number two, an area I don't think you should ever neglect is your public records area. Think about all of the traumatic information that comes into the 911 center, the murders, the suicides, and other criminal matters, or even news media inquiries. There's somebody pulling those recordings and getting them out to the public, which means there's somebody listening to it all over again. Sometimes that's one designated person, and you really have to keep an eye on that person because they are exposing themselves over and over and over again to a whole different level of trauma. It's not just the accumulation of trauma. In that case, it's helplessness because they're listening to it and they can't even intervene to do anything about it. We had a media inquiry for an explosion at a power plant. It was a horrific 911 call because the guy on the phone was describing what happened to the other two guys. There was a second call within the day or a very short period of time about a murder. There was a need to prepare a 911 call for a murder trial and then a third, a very gruesome helicopter crash where the driver was sitting next to his father who was just killed by a helicopter that landed in the street and chopped the truck in half. To have to hear the driver describe what he's looking at, it's pretty traumatic stuff. So they prepared these three things and sent them out to where they needed to go, whatever news media outlet or court outlet needed them. But think about what that person had to listen to all day. That's tough. And last but not least, this is the most important, especially for you administrators out there. These are your first first responders. I'm sure you've heard that term before. They are the first contact the citizens have with your agency. So I ask if they're dealing with the accumulation of trauma, if they're dealing with depression, and if they're not well adjusted, what do you think the conversations are that are taking place between them and the citizens? The, the citizens generally don't have a very long fuse when it comes to calling the non-emergency lines or 911. Sometimes the wait times alone are enough to make people very upset and that gets back to the staff level. And then you can't. Sometimes you have to sacrifice the non-emergency line in favor of the 911. So think of this. What if a maladjusted emergency call taker has a confrontation with somebody on the phone who's not real happy with law enforcement now? And who do you think the first person to knock on the door to handle their emergency is? It's a law enforcement officer. Does that lead to an unnecessary use of force? Does it lead to another complaint? Does it lead to a bad public image? Your dispatchers are so important and their mental health and well-being is sometimes neglected or overlooked. I'm certain that you show appreciation, or at least I would hope you do. But there's a whole different level of trauma in any active shooter call, and think of where all the information is coming from. It's a flood of 911 calls, and they're trying to get the information out to you to save lives. So here are some suggestions. Include any comm center in a debrief of a very traumatic incident. Make sure that their voice is heard too. 
If there's a traumatic call that happens on the street and you're an officer, why don't you call the dispatcher and just give them some closure? Tell them what actually happened. See if they have some questions. A lot of times they just want to fill in the blank instead of going home trying to figure it out for themselves and burying themselves in a bottle. And lastly, include them in your exercises, not just to monitor the channel, but to be part of the exercise. If you're going to train, train in reality and pull them in as part of it. It's communications. If you look at any major disaster over the last 10 or 15 years at an after action report, you'll see that the first thing that collapsed was the communications part. Not the communication center, but the communications between everybody there. So why wouldn't you train with them? Why not bring them into the training? I hope this has been enlightening to you. I hope that you learned something today and I hope that you treat them a little bit different they deserve our love and respect, and I will always give that to them. Head to thecomcenter.com for the latest updates of our true crime-flavoured show. On behalf of Andrew Baxter, thank you for watching.